right, it's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. If you have your Bible, Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14, it's good to be here this morning. I trust God's blessed you. Appreciate all those that were able to attend the birthday party yesterday. I know the family does. If you're visiting this morning, you're our special guest. Amen. All right, Mark chapter 14, and we'll start our reading in verse 50. Mark 14, verse 50. The Bible says, And they all forsook him and fled. And there followed him a certain young man, having a linen cloth cast about his naked body. And the young man laid on him. And he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. I want to preach to you on the thought, the man that gave the shirt off his back. Father, we love you today. We are grateful for your goodness to us. And we ask now that you would bless as we look in the Word of God this morning. And we pray that you would uh, speak to our hearts. I pray if there be one here that's never truly been saved. Lord, we ask that you would uh, do what no one can do but the Holy Spirit of God. And that is to bring deep conviction into that life. For those of us that are saved, Lord... We ask that you would stir our hearts and you would do something and draw us closer to you. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Just by way of introductions, uh, what has taken place here, the Lord uh, has made his way to Gethsemane, the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, one of the most troublesome times, the most burdensome times as far as Christ's life uh, has ever uh, transpired at this time. You say, what do you mean, preacher? Well, I use those words for a reason because in the garden is where the Lord prayed, uh, Father, if it possible, be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Now, many people get upset there and they get, uh, I wouldn't say upset, but they get mixed up there. They're thinking that Christ is uh, scared of going to the cross and dying at Calvary. Uh, that is not the subject. The, the thought there is, is this. The Lord has never had sin placed upon his life. He's never done wrong. He's never sinned. Can you imagine never to think a bad thought, never to lose your temper, never to do anything wrong? Can you imagine? Uh, the Bible said, neither was there guile found in his mouth. In other words, Jesus was perfect. We believe in a sinless Christ. If, if, we didn't, if, if I didn't believe in that, I'd just go ahead and give on up. But he kept, we were talking about the law in Sunday school, and if you missed it, you missed it. Uh, Jesus kept the law, friend. He not only kept it, he fulfilled it. Amen? And so the Lord has made his way to Gethsemane. Now, uh, why did he go to Gethsemane, preacher? Well, the people were following the Lord. They were listening to the Lord. And the scriptures tells us, they said, lest there be an uproar amongst the people. And so what you see in Gethsemane is this. The Lord Jesus has came across the Sidron River and he's come to the Gethsemane, the garden, and there he's offering himself to those wicked men who will take and crucify him at Calvary. And basically, he laid his life down. If you like Old Testament typology, they would not kill the bullet unless it was without the camp, outside of the camp. So the Lord Jesus, as a lamb, uh, giving his life, leaves Jerusalem, comes through the Sidron River, and lays his life down in Gethsemane for his father. But he prays and says, Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And that's when God uh, allows things to transpire. If you'll remember just before the Lord went to Gethsemane, they were in the upper room and all the disciples there were there. We're going to talk about those disciples this morning for a little bit. But they were there. They were the men that gave their lives to follow Christ wholeheartedly. All of them but one, I personally believe, were saved Judas was there in their midst, but he never really got saved because he went out and hung himself and wept bitterly, the Bible says, after he betrayed him. Well, the Lord had told him in the upper room, he says, uh, one of you shall betray me. And uh, the disciples, they, 
They didn't know what he was talking about or who he was talking about. Oh, my. What a thought. They didn't know. I'm talking about, listen, I'm talking about John, the beloved. I'm talking about Peter, James. I'm talking about these disciples who love God. None of them knew who would betray the Lord, uh, including themselves. And the Lord said, uh, he that dippeth the sop with me, the same as he that betrayed me. And about that time he mentions that, Judas reached out his hand, and the Lord revealed who would betray him. Well, Judas had betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. That's the price of a slave, a Hebrew slave. And he had told these men, when we get into the garden, you'll know the right one to take when you see me kiss him. It's called the kiss of betrayal. And now look, whether Judas was saved or lost, uh, when you see the time that he spent with the Lord, the Lord loved Judas. And Judas was a lost man in the midst of saved disciples. They're there, and Judas leans over and kisses the Lord, and the Lord says these words. He said, Betrayest thou thy friend with a kiss? And the Bible said Judas that day went out and wept bitterly. Well, I've said all that to say this. It's one thing for a lost man to forsake the Lord, isn't it? It's one thing for a lost man to just not want to live for God. That's, that's, that's automatic. But I want to draw your attention to our text in verse 50. And they all forsook him. Now, here's what I want you to see. The... Uh, Caiaphas and, and, and Pilate, he's going to be coming before them, but the Roman soldiers are coming, and they're coming with staves and, and swords, the Word of God tells us, and they're fixing to take Jesus and put him on an open trial. There they'll strip him naked. Keep that in your mind. It's going to mean something here in a little bit. Uh, I tell you, you talking about humiliating a man and publicly, publicly bringing him out and stripping him naked before mankind. And then they would spit in his face. They beat him and mocked him. And the Bible uses the word scourge. They scourged him. They literally beat him with a cat of nine tails until the internal organs were exposed is what that means. Paul said it this way. Uh, when, when the Apostle Paul was beaten and scourged, he literally would be able to look around and look at the bottom of his feet and see parts of a man's internal organs after he had been scourged. So this is where Jesus is headed, but his disciples forsook him. Now it's, it's important to learn the word here, forsook. What it means is this, they had had a call upon their life. Do you remember the Lord had called them into the ministry? And they had left everything in their life. Their, Peter left his fishing boat. They left their lifestyle to follow the Lord. But here is a time when persecution and hatred and heartache and sorrow is on Christ the Lord's life like it's never been before. This is a time, if you will, this is right before his worst hour on this earth. And his disciples, the Bible said it. I didn't say it. Now, I'm not talking about lost people here. I'm talking about people who love God, who believe the Bible, who have come out and followed the Lord. These men literally forsook Christ. What does it mean? It means to lay him aside. Now, I'm afraid to inform you this morning, but there's many folk that have just laid the Lord aside in their life. And they just don't want anything to do with Him. And it's not because of persecution, friend. It's not because He's going to Calvary. It's because they don't want to follow that road where He's leading them. Well, I got to thinking about this. How many have ever heard the saying, that man will... He's such a good man, he'll give you the shirt off his back. How many have ever heard that? Well, I'm not saying that, that's where that this is where that phrase come from. But I want to point the thought out. Here is a young man, a certain man. God doesn't even name him. And I want to look into his life for a moment and look at a few things. The disciples, the disciples had forsaken the Lord. 
They had laid him aside. Well, the moment we read that, the Holy Spirit comes out and he highlights and singles out a young man. Now look, would to God, God would get a hold of our lives while we're young. Would to God we'd get rid of the sin of our life, live for God, and decide to live for God while we're young. I don't know if you noticed in the song that we sung, Trust and Obey, but I have never noticed that. That's why I like to sing. Somebody said, well, we've got to sing all the verses. Well, the meaning of it is to learn the song, to memorize the song. And in that song, it talks about the favor of God only being for Christians. Amen? God's favor is on my life. Well, hear this. The Holy Spirit points out something in this young man's life. And you know what it is? He said, but a certain young man followed him. You see that? It's in the text. Now, what he means there is this. It means that this young man chose to occupy his life with the Lord. Now look here, no doubt in my mind God loves all of mankind. Scripture teaches us that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loves mankind. Josh, you may want to go out there and crank my truck because they got, get mad, might get mad at me here in a minute. But you know what the problem is? Mankind don't love God. A lot of people don't love God. They say they love God. I've heard it. I've seen it. Oh, yeah, preacher, I love the Lord and can't find him with a search warrant. I love the Lord. Well, look, here is, here is the Lord his, uh, literally exposing a problem in the life of faithful men. Now, look, I'm not talking about somebody who just stands and teaches Sunday school. I'm talking about Peter, the apostle Peter. This man stood on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 men got saved. He forsook Christ in his worst hour. Now you say, how do you see that, preacher? Well, if you look in the Bible, if you'll read in the Bible there, right as he leaves Gethsemane, the Holy Spirit of God highlights Peter's life. He's standing in the bottom of the palace while the Lord is being stripped naked like an animal, being beaten and whipped and spit on. Peter, God's man, God's faithful man, is standing around a fire warming himself, nourishing his flesh. Now look, the scriptures tells us a young lady looks upon Peter. Here's what I want you to see. You know what? No man lives to himself and no man dies to himself. Josh, let me tell you why people don't want to, don't want to follow God today. You know why a lot of people don't believe in God? Because they ain't seeing nobody live for God. Everybody talks about it, but living for God, loving God. See, hey, look, if you're going to tell, I'd rather see a Christian as hear one any day. Show me something. Well, God here is going to reveal to a young man, reveal to his disciples something here to you and I that you and I, I, I honestly, I believe we need in all of our life. We're talking about Peter, James, John. We're talking about all these disciples. The scriptures when it says and they forsook him. We're not talking about lost people that forsook him. We're talking about saved people that forsook him. In other words, uh, I'll follow him as long as it's beneficial to me. As long as it benefits me. As long as it helps me. I'll follow him. Well here was a time in his life to where they were going to spit in his face, mock him and beat him, and God wanted to highlight who was going to follow him. Now here it is, you with me? This young man followed the Lord. Now look, we don't know who he is. God doesn't mention his name, but I'll tell you one thing he did do. God saw fit to show that this man favored the Lord. Now, it's one thing for God's favor to be on my life, but it's another for me to favor the Lord. What do you mean, preacher? Well, this man, you can't tell me he wasn't educated enough to what would transpire some, to some extent in Pilate's judgment hall. 
because many men had been ju uh, judged and many had been crucified. And so there was some common things that they were aware of. And one of them, I personally believe, was the stripping of the individual. Now, can you imagine somebody taking you out publicly and stripping you naked before mankind? Well, that's what was coming in the Lord's life, and that's what, that's what takes place here. Well, I want you to notice that this young man, the Bible says, followed the Lord. It means that he chose to occupy his life with Christ. He obtained the Lord. He included the Lord. He was a disciple of the Lord. Now, you know what? Your life would change so much if you'd just choose to occupy in your life Christ. If you and I just follow Christ, no matter, not lay him aside, not forsake him, but follow him wholeheartedly. I mean, hey, look, the best decision you and I could make in our life is to wholeheartedly learn to follow God. Hey, it pays, friend. It pays. Here is a man who, as far as I know, has never preached. far as I know, never given a Sunday school lesson. But these great preachers, Josh, and these great men of God, when it came down to te passing the test, they left the Lord sitting alone. They didn't identify with him. They left him. All, they all forsook him. They wouldn't stay there with him. And the Holy Spirit of God points out this young man. You know what this young man does? Something like this. He knew the Lord was going to be persecuted. And he knew that the Lord was going to be spit and mocked on. He knew it was coming. Because it had happened personally in the city several times to other men. The Lord was fixing to go stand before Pilate. You remember the message when they wrapped the building, the Roman soldiers seized the building where you couldn't get in or couldn't get out. Pilate stood up high and the Lord, the, the, the one that would be on judgment would come in and Pilate would judge that individual and that individual had no way in or no way out. They knew these things would happen and so the Lord, here he is in his worst hour, this young man looks over he had been looking, I personally believe it, Peter, James, and John, and all those men's life. And in the worst hour of our darling Lord's life, these men forsook him, but not this young man. You know what he did? He followed him. And right, I personally believe, before he was forced to leave, you know what he did? He took his outer garment off and left it for the Lord there wasn't a lot that he could do for the Lord his time with the Lord was only for a short time but did you know what he was saying in a way toward God I'm going to favor God. I'm going to do something in my life that honors God. I'm willing to give up something for the Lord. The, the little bit of time that I've known Him, now it's time for me to do something for God. Hey, look, God's died for you at Calvary. He rose again. My question to you and I, what are we going to do for the Lord? And this young man come out, buddy. All that you can talk about the courage of these other disciples and they were filled with courage. You can talk about how good they were. One of them walked on water with the Lord. But here is a young man and in a time of his life, in his, in his youth, in his young 20, I say in his 20s, that's what I personally believe. He stepped out and said, I don't care what kind of persecution comes my way. I don't care what kind of heartaches come in my way. I'm identifying with him. There's something about him. He's done too much. He's fed the hungry. He's healed the blind. He's raised the dead. And I'm going to publicly identify myself with him. And I want to do something for you. He lays that outer garment aside. What a testimony. Let me ask you something. When's the last time you've done something for God? Preacher, I ain't been called to preach. That's not what I ask you. 
When's the last time you've done something for the Lord? I was amazed this morning. I really was. I was totally amazed, Brother Mark. Your name's Misty, isn't it? Misty, I'm so glad you're here. Ask them. I preach better when you're here, I promise. Just ask them. But I was amazed this morning. I had a miracle. I had somebody under 30 make me a promise and keep it. It's amazing. This generation nowadays, people make you promise. I've heard them, I'm a coming preacher, I'll see you. Can't find them with a search warrant. But here the Lord is. This young man takes his outer garment and lays it down to the Lord. It is though that this man is favoring God. He's a, doing something for the Lord that's assisting the Lord. Now, did the Lord need assistance? No, he didn't need it. And I thought about this. What caused this young man to gain this kind of character that he would so stand for God in such an hour? And I found out what it was. It's in our text. It's actually highlighted before he takes his coat off. First of all, he follows the Lord. Somebody said, preacher, I want to be one follow God. I want to follow God. With all my heart, I want to follow the Lord. That's a wonderful thing to follow God. But you know what? You can be following the things of God and never really touch hold of God. This young man, the Bible says, here's what he did. He got, he got close to the Lord and he laid hold of him. The word means to grip or to grasp or to hold on to. To fasten oneself to. Now here's what I want you to see. We're almost done. If people would learn to fasten their life to God. They would make their mind up no matter what. No matter what comes. I'm going to grab hold of the tail, the, the hem of his garment. I'm going to follow God with all my heart. I'm going to live for God. I'm going to love God. Things would happen. Here we are, thousands of years later, talking about what one young man did in the Garden of Gethsemane. And we're talking about it this morning. What's it going to be in your life a year from now? Well, you know, her, she's still doing the same thing. She still ain't got right with God. They still need to get some things corrected in their life. You know how that fella is. He'll lie to you soon. Just as soon as open his mouth, he'll lie to you. You know what? When you decide and I decide that we're going to follow God, we're going to grab hold of him and we're going we're to anywhere he goes, where he leads, I will follow. Where he leads, I'll follow. Whatever he does, whatever. See, God, Jesus, did not want the man's coat. He didn't want his coat. He wanted his life. And this morning, friend, as good as your intentions are, as good as mine are, God wants one thing that you have, and that's your life. He doesn't want your money. Matter of fact, let me just tell you, when God's got your life, he'll get your wallet. I'm telling you, the Lord's done so much for me. The greatest thing this man ever done in his life was give his life to the Lord. I can remember, if you'd go back in my lifestyle, somebody said, oh, y'all not say that on Facebook. I want this on Facebook, Brother Marty. Keep it rolling. I can remember when the most important thing to me, it wasn't my Bible. It wasn't God, it's a big bag of dope, something I can get high on. And I not only got high on it, Brother Mark, I sold it for a living. I gambled, I had a compulsive, I was a compulsive gambler at the age of 17, 18. It was killing my family. Best thing, you know what the greatest thing on my day on Saturday was, was to take a Miller Lite and a bag of dope and roll me a joint and bet my hard-earned work money on football. That was bad. That was bad. You're right. But you know what? 
when I grab hold of the, the Lord Jesus. I'm telling you right now, there's people who still are amazed that I'm preaching. God not only saved my wretched soul, but he took that trash out of my life. God changed me overnight. Now I'm preaching the unsearchable riches of Christ. God's blessed me with a wonderful business and a wife and a family. And God has changed my entire life all because I gave him my life. You know what? You can take this as bragging if you want. I'm just telling you the truth. In the morning, Josh, when I come, I'm going to pretty much well do what I want, Arna, buddy. He works with us, doing a great job. Arna, nobody's telling me what to do over there, Arna. They're not. A nobody. A nobody. A wicked sinner, willful sinner, God took a wicked, filthy mouth, dope smoking, beer drinking rebel and saved him. Amen. Saved him. And did you know what? God's not a respecter of person, He loves you as much as He loves me. As much as he loves this young man, as much as he loved those disciples. And I just thought it a little ironic this morning. Here this man is, a young man. All these other disciples flee in such a good time. What an opportunity. I mean, where is Peter? I know he stood out here and he took off Malchus's ear. I, I, I know all that. But where is Peter and James and them standing up and not standing? Uh-uh. Stay, they knew what was coming. Judas had betrayed him and all these guards and all this persecution's coming in. And did you know what? Anybody can tell you that they love God. But you know what? When you get in a position like this in life and you got stuff on your, on your hey, look, I'm telling you, brother, when God saved me, people couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe it. And you say, preacher, how'd you do it? I'd like to do it. I didn't do it. I realized for the first time in my life that there was a God in heaven and he shed his blood for me and he loved me and he saved me. And I said, I'll tell you what. He's real. He's real. I know he's real. And I surrendered my life to him. Said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and life and save me. Listen to this. Help me to regain my family. You know what God done? God saved a rebel. My family has more respect for me now than they ever have. Parents, listen to me. Later on in my life. They love me, got respect for me. You know why? Because I tell you something God's good at. God's good at taking a little unknown man or woman that doesn't know nothing but sin and God changes their life. The Holy Spirit of God can come in your heart and life and He can change you. He can mold you. He can lead you down the right path. And you know what? Thank God I did what this young man did. You know what he did? He occupied his life with the things of Christ. Now let me tell you what that means. This morning you made a decision. You said, I'm going to go to church. I don't know how many of you see, but I posted a little thing on Facebook, a little baby in his, in his diaper, and he said, are you going to church? <laughs> it was fun. If you get a chance, look on that. But you know what? I can tell you, one of the greatest things, Josh, when I get to heaven, I'm never, ever going to be asked this question. Did you know what, Brother Mark? My children have never asked me, Daddy, are we going to church? They never asked me that. You know what went on in my home after I got saved? My wife was ironing little dresses, two little dresses. She was ironing her so. And I finally got my old deadbeat self off my blessed assurance and got up and got my clothes ready. Everything's going to come down on you on church day. It's going to be hard for you to get here on, on time at church. It's all going to be. But guess what? 
God wants your life. He doesn't want what you can offer. He wants your life. God wants 100% of your life, every bit of you. He doesn't want, ha- and he, re- 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 he will refuse to do any other way. I'd like to ask you a question this morning. Has there ever been a time, first of all, that you've invited Christ in your life? You said, look, I'm tired of living this way. I'm tired of living in sin. Preach, I was just like you. And I've come to the point in my life, I need God to save me. I don't want to die and go to hell. I want to get right with God. Maybe that's you this morning. If that's you, you just need to come on and get saved. But if you're here and you're a Christian, you've been saved before. But you've never truly surrendered your life. You've never said, Lord, I'm tired of living my way. God, I'm tired of offering you things that you don't. Do you really believe the God of heaven needed that young man's coat? No. He just said, he looked at Peter, and you know what he said? He said, could I not call 12 legions of angels to come and Could I not do it? He said, but that hindered my father. God doesn't need nothing you and I have. He just desires it. He just wants it. And I figured this out about the Lord. A lot I don't know about him. But when God started working in my life, it wasn't that God was in a demanding way and wanted me to live for him, to glorify him, although that's the major goal. But here's what God wanted. God wanted to change my life and save me for me you know those struggles you go through sometimes those heartaches those troubles those heart sometimes we go through difficult times the Lord loves you and wants to change your life and if you'd get right with God Hebrews chapter 12 verse 12 wherefore seeing we're all so compassed about with so great a cloud of witness watch it let us lay aside see many people have laid him aside They've placed him over to the side. And God said, if you'll place your sin aside, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him, Paul said. He said, look, lay everything else out of your life but the Son of God. Has there ever been a time in your life, whether you're saved or lost, you've just wanted to occupy your heart and your life with him, with him and nothing else. And you say, preacher, I don't know how to do that. Quit worrying about what people think. Don't worry about what's going on in your life right now this morning. Just do this. Here in a minute, we're going to have what's called an altar call. And let me tell you something I love about God. We all, there's no big eyes, Brother Josh, Josh, there's no little use. We all come by the playing fields, all level, all at the foot of Calvary, all by Calvary. And what you need to do is this. You know what that means in in a time of war? I give up, surrender. See, some of y'all battling with God in your heart. You're struggling. You're at enmity. You know what enmity means? It means you're at war with God. Let me tell you something. You are going to lose. (laughs) You're at war with God. And so what I do, preacher, you do the same thing I did. I just finally did. Because I done ruined so much of my life. I done marred my marriage. I done damaged my children as little as they was. And I said, God, I've done nothing but make a mess of my life. Here's my life. Save me. Come into my heart and life and save me. Change me. You know what he did? Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. I'm telling you, I was a wretched rebel when I invited Christ into my life. He cleaned me. You ever felt dirty? But he washed my sins away. He came into my life, established my going, placed my feet on a solid rock, and now that young rebel 
that gave his life to the Lord Jesus, others are sitting at the feet of his voice being instructed. You know why? Here it is. I'll never understand it. God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God said, I'll take a little old young, dope, smoking, beer, drinking, gambling rebel and I'll change his life and save him. And others will hear the message of my son at Calvary and they'll get saved. Oh, my, my, my. The greatest decision I ever made in my life was to bow before the God of heaven. And get it right, I felt better, I was clean. I couldn't, I couldn't hold it in. Uh-uh. I'm, I commenced to tell, when I, when I got saved, I thought the book of Job was the book of Job because I had less than an eighth grade education. The Holy Spirit of God, as I sat under his tutelage, Brother Chuck, he taught me my vocabulary. He taught me. I went to school, went to Bible school, got it, went back to school, got it right, did it right, amen. But just look what God can do with an unknown rebel. I wonder this morning, are you tired of living the life that you're living? I mean, man, it's been the same old thing. Every now and then you'll turn a new leaf over and things will things will get better. But The bottom line is this. You have never truly, truly surrendered. Brother Marty, I want you to cue Brother Cottle's song for me that I like, if you would. I want you to listen to me this morning. I want you to stand with me with your head bowed, eyes are closed, no one looking around, no one moving. If you've got to go to the bathroom, do it now. No one looking. Nobody moving, no shuffling. This serious time. No one looking around. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If you're here this morning and you're tired of battling with God and you want to get it right with God, you want to, you want, you want to surrender your life to God today, I want you to listen to the words of this song of this dear preacher friend of mine that wrote this song. I'm reminded God is good. God can change your life, friend. He desires to. He longs to. You're here and you're a Christian and you just need to come. Maybe you've been on the the preaching this morning, you know you're saved, but you need to come. Hey, don't you hinder nobody else. You leave your place no matter who you are, and you come around this old-fashioned altar as he plays this song. I want you to listen to it now. Don't, don't, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God, child of God. If you're saved and God's touched your heart, you need to move. Come now. I'm blessed to see a flower spring up from a seed. That's been planted in the earth at early you spring. Would you come when you do it? Would you come now? Every time I'm blessed to see the sunrise of another morning and hear the song the tiny bluebird sings. When I consider how God carved the mountains out with his own hand. I said, you painted God, them so moving, with colors come, do it, of the woods. Nature in and of itself seems to share a message that reminds me that the God I serve is good. I'm reminded God is good. He loves you. Got you here this morning. Even though I fail to thank Him like I should, I'm reminded that He cares when He hears and answers prayer and makes a way for me just like He said He would. Even when He sends the rain and my heart is filled pain. He'll be working all things 
for my good. No matter if I'm basking in the sunlight on the mountain or walking through the valley, God is good. Listen closely to this next verse. It's my favorite in the whole song. Every time I'm blessed to feel the warm embrace of those I love and hear them tell me that they love me, my heart is thrilled. Yet I'm reminded of a greater love extended from my God above when he sent his son to die on Calvary's hill. Oh, the precious blood that Jesus shed that day Had the power to wash my sin away Jesus did what no mortal man could By laying down his sinless life He became the supreme sacrifice And that assures me that my God is good I'm reminded God is good Even though I fail to thank Him like I should I'm reminded that He cares When He hears and answers prayer And makes a way for me Just like He said He would Even when He said the rain and my heart is filled with pain you'll be working all things for my good no matter if I'm basking in the sunlight on the mountain or walking through the valley God is good no in the sunlight on the mountain or walking through the valley God is good Amen Good to be in God's house I'm telling you right now the greatest decision I ever made in my life is to accept Christ and follow him just real quickly before we dismiss, maybe you're here this morning and you, you say, Preacher, I got, to have, I got to say something. The Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Maybe God's touched your heart and you just want to publicly thank the Lord for your salvation. I don't know what it is. We'll give you that time to do that right now. Real quickly before we dismiss. Anybody? Anybody? Brother Chris, yes, ma'am. I'm glad you and Josh are here. Amen. 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 I told you. Back. Yeah, I believe they will. I told you to tell them I preach better when they come. I'm glad they're here too. Yes, sir. Amen. 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 Bless you, brother. May the Lord bless you. Uh, just uh, sometimes it's good to let it out. Yes, sir. Did you have something? I praise the Lord for my salvation and especially giving us hope in a hopeless world. Yes. Amen. Yes. It is sick out there. Yes. And we have the answer. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Someone else before we dismiss. All right, don't forget, be with us tonight if you can. Prayer room, 445, and we'll be back in the life of David this evening. It's been good to be in God's house. Any other word before we dismiss? All right, then. Uh, Brother Marty, why don't you dismiss us if you would? Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for the opportunity we have to come and worship you and to hear the gospel preached, Lord. And I just pray that, you'll, um, that we'll take the message this morning and not forsake you and go on our own way, but cleave unto you and hold to you and and make you part of our life and the leader of our souls and our lives. Yes, and that yes, um, we'll follow you in, our, in your footsteps no matter where it leads. And I just pray that you'll be with us the rest of this day, bring us back this evening for the evening service, and, um, and be with Chris as he prepares the message for this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.